Get started. Um, everybody, welcome to ICT's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dama Saro, who's a research professor at University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, I was specifically instructed not to give a long introduction, not to give a long bio of him, <laughs> um, but uh, I'll just mention some, uh, some quick facts. Uh, about a half an hour ago, I introduced him to Google Scholar which uh, keeps track of your citation count online. He hadn't seen it before. Um, over a four-decade uh, uh, four um, career in science, uh, he has over 11,000 citations. So if you think about it, it's a, a, almost a citation every single day that somebody is referring to his work um, over this period. So it's an amazing period of work. Um, so I just wanted to welcome Dom Massaro. People hear me okay? Thanks, Ari, that was, that was great. I really appreciate that nice short introduction. Um, so I really appreciate everyone coming out for the pizza party and uh, uh, I think I'm getting some feedback. Let me put it a little lower. How's that, can people hear me okay? Uh, <clears throat> so today I'm gonna take you through some of my early work. Can they be turned? Can they be turned off? Okay. Oh, that's off. How about this? How's this? Is this good? Okay. People hear me? Okay. All right. Great. So I'm going to puzzle through the idea that children might learn to read naturally without instruction if they're immersed in written language from day one. Obviously, that hasn't happened because we haven't had the technology to do it, but I think it is on the horizon. Uh, to get there, I'm going to take you first through our work in speech perception and language understanding and then lead into reading. So if we think about early literacy, uh, here's the current dogma that somehow speech is special so that um, it's, if you take Noam Chomsky, you have something, a wired-in module that simply evolves. It doesn't follow the rules of perception and learning. It matures like another organ. Maybe I should just turn this off. Yeah, and the other one, sorry. That's it. Okay, can, all right. All right, let's see, which one is it? Okay, is it any of these, or was it just the feedback? Can you hear me now? No, you can hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, great, all right. All right, so um, reading, on the other hand, is artificial, and it must be taught, and usually the expectation is kids have to mature to about school age before you can begin instruction in reading. So let me take you first through our work with speech perception um, that, should I try to turn it on again and see why we're getting the feedback or, okay. Where we took issue with the idea that speech is special. So where we're going is we're looking at speech perception and language understanding as a prototypical pattern recognition problem where the perceiver is simply making inferences about the input and succeeding at processing speech and language. Our work was done in the context of the contribution of the face to language understanding. So we know anecdotally that face-to-face -face communication is much more effective when you have the face as well as a voice, as opposed to just the voice alone. So I have a couple demos to show the power of the face. Okay, so when I play this to my, my uh, class, I tell the, the boys in the audience, if you didn't get that, see me after class. <laughs> so to study, uh, face-to-face -face speech perception, we developed a computer-animated talking head, and we'll let Baldy tell you about himself. Should that be louder?
Is that loud enough? People can hear it? Okay. So uh, Baldy, I'll tell you a little bit about him, the technology about it. Obviously, many people here are involved in developing virtual characters. Uh, Baldy can display the different emotions. Uh, and um, we can see here. I am surprised. Sometimes the video. I am surprised. So you can see how we can, we can blend the speech with the emotion. And we've developed Baldy for different languages so he can speak Mandarin. And the goal has always been from a speech science point of view where we develop the speech to be as accurate as possible. We can also align Baldy with natural speech. And Baldy can also be a vocalist. So we can uh, we can align him with with uh, singing. So here's what what the words were. All right, so you can think of Baldy as a puppet on a set of strings. And moment by moment, we're moving these strings to create the accurate speech. And we use so-called FAPs, facial control parameters, such as jaw, jaw rotation, lip zipping, retraction, jaw lowering, and so on. Okay, how does Baldy work? Well, uh, in the animation, each phoneme of the language has a set of target values for those different FAPs, facial control parameters. And they're blended together in a co-articulation scheme. We know that when we talk, a given segment is influenced by segments that precede it and follow it. This is called co-articulation. And the way we blend these segments together is in terms of these dominance functions. So for a particular control parameter, uh, you could think that the default cases, they would have equal dominance, as we see here, where each segment contributes equally, and you simply interpolate between the two segments. But most segments, when they're aligned, do not have equal dominance for the different facial control parameters. So for example, if we take lip protrusion, okay, where your lips are protruded, if you say the word stew, you see that the protrusion is also present in the S and the T. So there's much more dominance for the protrusion parameter uh, for the U than for the S and T. So it comes forward and influences uh, the articulation of those segments. So here you're getting some protrusion. So this is the amount of lip protrusion. You're getting some in the S and T uh, because that the U has much more dominance, okay? So it gets to its target value and it, it spreads the protrusion into the S and T. And this blending function has been shown to work very well. People have tested it against actual speech in several languages and several animation uh, models and show that it shows that it works much better than a simply, simple concatenation or other kinds of things like uh, complete dominance, but rather it's relative dominance as you see here. Now, I mentioned that the face is very powerful and indeed it is. You can show how much it contributes to understanding. So in an experiment we did, we had 71 subjects and they came in and they had to identify words in short sentences like please pick up the pencil 
So they would hear a sentence and noise, and <clears throat> they would just type in as many words as they could understand. And there were different conditions in terms of the amount of noise, whether it was natural speech or uh, synthetic speech. And you get individual differences too. So maybe these subjects that were performing very poorly, they were at a rock concert the night before. Um, so you get some individual differences, but these also come from different conditions. So in the same experiment to show the power of Baldy, uh, we align Baldy with the same sentences that they were hearing without a face. And you can see that for every subject, performance improved dramatically in terms of the number of words that were recognized. So particularly for the subjects that were doing very poorly, you see that their performance improved by two or three times. But every subject, even those doing very well, benefits from <coughs> having the face as well as the voice. And as I said, we developed the visible speech to be as accurate as possible, and we use this gold standard, real talkers. So our comparison here was a radio announcer that had very good articulation, and we included that condition in the experiment also, and the Baldi's uh, improvement was still about 5% below a real talker. And so we're continually trying to reach that gold standard of how much a real talker contributes. Obviously, you could do things like hyper-articulate, where you could even do better than a real talker, but our goal is to just match the performance of a real talker. In addition to improving speech, uh, it can create so-called illusions. They're not really illusions because they simply illuminate how pattern recognition works. How many people here have experienced the so-called so McGurk effect? Okay, so a few of you. So Baldi's going to say a set of syllables like ga, va, ba, da, da. What you want to do is simply watch and listen and sort of keep track of what you perceived, what syllables you perceived. I'll play four syllables and just keep track of them. Okay, so there were four syllables. Now, <clears throat> how many people perceived the syllable be, to be changing from syllable to syllable? Okay, great, great. Okay, so he's nice and big. In fact, the syllable was always the auditory syllable ba. Okay, but my face was going ba, va, da, da, or Baldi's face was, all right? So, if you were perceiving a different syllable, that means that you were somehow being influenced by the face as well as the voice in terms of what you perceive. So I can play those again, and you can listen to them with your eyes closed to see what you hear, or you can look again and see if the face is influencing what you hear. So one thing about this influence, it's not under voluntary control. If you're looking at the face, you can't help but be influenced by it. So I've been looking at this for many decades and still get the influence of the face, even though I know that it's artificial. Okay, so, um, so our, our animated face is good enough to produce the same kind of influence that we get uh, with real faces. So we use our animated face in a variety of experiments and they can be well described by our fuzzy logical model of perception which I've proved is mathematically equivalent to Bayes' theorem. How many people know about Bayes' theorem? Okay, good. So you know that's a magical way of combining multiple sources of information to arrive at some uh, idea of the likelihood of an event and it turns out to be an optimal way to do it. So in our model, there's an initial evaluation stage where you get information from a variety of sources of information. You evaluate those with respect to how much they support the various alternatives. You integrate them together in this multipl multiplicative fashion. And then on the output, you're looking at the overall goodness of match to the various alternatives. And then you make a decision on that basis. And that comes out to be mathematically equivalent to Bayes' theorem. How does the perceiver learn? Well, the perceiver gets feedback. Uh, the mother could say, get the ball, not the doll. So the child then can 
use that learning to uh, improve their evaluation parameter, how much that sensory information supports one alternative versus another. So we've t tested, and other investigators have tested this model repeatedly in a variety of experiments and show that it does a good job. So a typical experiment would be one in which we could manipulate two sources of information, the face and the voice, independently of one another. So we, using synthetic speech, we could create a sound that goes from ba to da in small steps. We could create an animation that goes from ba to da in small steps. And then in, included in the experiment, we can also have unimodal trials in which the perceivers are getting just the voice or just the face. And <clears throat> what the model predicts is a, an American football shaped result in that um, both sources of information contribute to the percept, but in this Bayesian fashion, where the least ambiguous source has the most influence on the perception. Both sources are contributing. One isn't dominating the other, but they're contributing in this Bayesian fashion. And I'd be happy to go through that in more detail, or you could look at our publications to see how this works. So we test this model and compare it to other models uh, against the results of individual subjects. And so here's a subject that shows this American football shape pattern. So why do we fit it to individual subjects? Well, because we know that the average of a number of subjects might not look like anything, like anything of each individual subject. So we want to test the model against each subject. So here you see the points are the actual data, and the lines are the predictions of the model. So we've contrasted this to a lot of different kinds of models, um, and this ends up doing a better job. So we think we have a handle on how people utilize multiple sources of information in speech perception. And <clears throat> to get back to the original idea, um, we've argued that speech is not special. It's a typical pattern recognition domain, like recognizing objects in a three-dimensional world where you can use many cues to depth, like interposition, height in the picture plane, uh, stereo information. And people have shown that the same kind of pattern recognition scheme can work in that situation as it does in speech. So having developed this animated uh, face, we thought there might be some good application areas. And we thought the most obvious one was uh, with deaf and hard of hearing kids. These are kids in an oral language school. And they have limited vocabulary. And so we thought Baldy could help them learn their vocabulary. And we got an NSF grant to apply technology to a real world problem. And we worked here at the Tucker Maxim School. So uh, the parents felt that this was very successful so that um, they alerted ABC Primetime that did a little special on it uh, a, a time back. So here's a little part of that Primetime special. To see just how fast Baldy can work with Primetime had teachers create several new vocabulary lessons for oh, Timothy, God. words he had never spoken before. Let's talk about what you see. First, Baldy checks his knowledge. Click on the building bars. Then, Baldy shows Timothy each item correct. These are bowling balls. Followed by a drill of speaking the words for the very first time. What is this? Bowling ball. It's not easy. Click on the tennis rackets. No, that's not right. Timothy right. mispronounced and misidentified nine out of ten objects. But just three weeks later, we retested it. Okay, Timothy, you're ready for the final test. What is this? Soccer ball. This time, he got 9 out of 10 correct, and his pronunciation improved dramatically. What is this? Baseball. Okay, so um, it looked like Baldy was a big hit there in uh, 
intervening and improving these children's vocabulary, but we wanted to make sure that Baldy was really responsible for it. So there's an accepted procedure to show that your intervention is responsible for the change in behavior, and this is called a multiple baseline procedure. The way we implemented this is we took the children and they had three, we designated three sets of words that, that would eventually be learned, but they would only be trained on one set of words at a time. And the idea is that if the Baldy intervention were responsible, they would only learn the words from not that set and not the other sets. So we're always testing all three sets of words, but we're training on just one set. So if we start out with the pretest uh, for the three sets of words, you see that um, for this student here and the other, other students there, um, I'm sorry, this is one student. So for the set one words, uh, and the set two words and the set three words, they're pretty much a chance. The filled circles are uh, perception and the open circles are uh, production. Production is always more difficult than perception. Um, so here we implement training on the set one words and you see the child learns those words. The child's not learning the set two words. They're say, staying a chance. Uh, and then we implement training on the set two words. They learn the set two words they don't improve on the set three words. We implement training on the set three words and they learn those and then retain uh, all the words in memory. So this is an intervention that shows that indeed it was Baldy that was responsible for them learning the words. Uh, and so this convinces us that you know we've got something here that's meaningful. Uh, it's science rather than pseud pseudoscience and of course one of the criteria to see that it's science is that you get it published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, which we did. So Baldy was an effective vocabulary tutor. At about the same time, um, people in uh, studying autistic kids were interested whether Baldy might intervene uh, with uh, kids with autism. And so we started using Baldy as a tutor there. And in this particular case, Baldy is not teaching just grammar but he's also teaching, uh, I'm sorry, not teaching just vocabulary, but also grammar. So here he's teaching singular versus plural. And we can watch Tony here interacting with Baldy. And I should say, when you saw the original lessons that were on the ABC primetime, we had this tool where the teachers could make up the lessons. They could put in the dialogue and uh, Baldy would say it. So if you remember when ba uh, Timothy made a mistake, uh, Baldy said, no, that's not right. Well, that's pretty mean, right? And you'd never say that to an autistic kid. They would flip out, right? Um, so, uh, the, but the, the hard of hearing kids, they're just vor voracious. They want to learn so badly, it didn't bother them at all. And the teachers were used to that, so they could, they could type that in. So with, uh, with uh, Tony, we changed the dialogue, obviously, so that he wouldn't get these no's and so on. So Tony is autistic. He's got uh, some speech. Uh, he can be aggressive, but with Baldy, he, he just really uh, loves interacting with him. Let's practice with the ladybugs. Ladybugs. Correct. With the urine. Orange. You're all right. Click on the oranges. Nice job, Tony. With the glass. Glass. Correct. Click on the flowers. Flowers? Great work. Where's the glasses? Okay, so um, indeed we had the same success with the autistic kids that we did with the hard of hearing kids and we did the multiple baseline design and so on. So it looked like Baldy was good at uh, teaching these kids uh, grammar and vocabulary. Uh, both the hard of hearing kids and the autistic kids. So this was, uh, you know, a very successful project, and we've since then implemented Baldy on the uh, iPad. Uh, and so here's little Taryn, who's uh, it's a little tile matching game where you match two tiles to make them disappear. So you, 
the kids can get very engaged by this tile matching game, and I'd be happy to show people it on the iPad afterwards where we have a number of little lessons that the kids can uh, interact to learn vocabulary and grammar and phonics and so on. So remember, we're moving towards this idea of whether reading can be acquired naturally. And so I want to tell you about our research that we, dealt, we did in the domain of reading. And uh, as a scientist, I studied both speech perception and reading uh, at the same time. And it turns out that the same model that we applied to speech understanding also applies for reading. So for example, we did experiments in which we can manipulate multiple features to a letter. So we can make a continuum of letters between G and Q by varying the opening in the oval and the obliqueness of the line so that we could go from a prototypical G to a prototypical Q uh, using uh, this manipulation. So you have the same kind of factorial design. And when you look at the results, you get the same kind of American football shaped curve that one Q has more influence to the extent it's unambiguous uh, relative to the other Q. So we also, we know that in language understanding, there's many sources of information. There's what's so-called bottom-up sources of information and top-down sources like context. So we know when we're reading, the contextual information facilitates how quickly we can read and how accurately we can recognize the letters and words. So we did this little experiment where we took a continuum of, uh, of a letter between the prototypical letter C and a prototypical letter E, and then we placed this in these different contexts. So here, E is appropriate and C is not, and here C is appropriate and E is not, and the other two, they're either both appropriate or pro uh, both inappropriate. And so again, when you look at the perception, how often the person says E, you get the same American football shaped curve where when you have a very ambiguous letter here between C and E, the context has a much bigger influence than when the letter is less ambiguous. So the same kind of pattern recognition model uh, works in reading as well as in speech. So we have this belief then that speech and reading are very similar to one another. And if that's the case, then maybe reading can be acquired naturally in the same way that speech is acquired. So we want to take issue of this fact, uh, like Marianne Wolf, a neuroscientist, says that unlike its component parts such as vision and speech, which are genetically organized, reading has no direct genetic program, passing it on to future generations. So the, um, the NBC Today Show, maybe some of you saw this a year or so back, did this big expose of these companies that pr promote early reading, uh, where they got 10 neuroscientists to say that these kids before age five were not reading. They were just memorizing, whatever that means. To me. <laughs> I think mem we know memory is pretty critical in reading. But they were very skeptical of the idea that kids could learn to read uh, before going to school and certainly to read naturally. So the way I approached the question, uh, I saw that there seemed to be analogous processes in the two domains. So uh, when you start thinking about acquisition, I asked, well, what do you need for speech acquisition? Well, the baby needs to do some kind of signal analysis. Syllables seem to be inherent to our spoken language. They have to be combined. The child has to do some kind of category learning. And certainly we know from the so-called uh, poor uh, distressing cases of feral children that weren't exposed to language, they need this early immersion into language. And it's, over, it's overwhelming how much language these babies get. So in the first year, uh, they, they've estimated that babies get about 1,000 hours of speech. Okay, um, They don't say anything, but they're hearing a lot. And that comes out to be about a million, a million words. So if we're going to have kids read naturally, we've got to get them a lot of print. So what's not needed, and this sometimes is a little um, 
uh, puzzling is they don't need a theory of mind. In other words, they don't need to know that you're a separate agent from them, that you can have different beliefs than them, that you're communicating something about your beliefs uh, to them. Uh, so as the car talk guys might say, you could learn to perceive speech unencumbered by the thought process. Okay, and that's pretty important if we're gonna immerse these kids in, writ in written language. Um, so we know that the early stages of, of, of learning seem to be very important. One example of this is Kanzi, who you may know of, of, of this chimp that learned a symbol language. Okay? And how did he learn it? Well, in fact, he learned it while his mother was being explicitly taught these symbols. And she had just had him uh, as an infant, and she was nursing him or holding him most of the time when she was learning. Well, in fact, she never learned. She never learned the language, but they uh, discovered that, in fact, Kanzi had learned the symbols. So he learned it without instruction. So it reinforces this idea that the brain has this explosive brain development in the first couple years of life. Uh, it's making all these connections and doing all this pruning, and that's the time that uh, sensory input seems to have its most uh, uh, impact on the system. So like speech perception, we can ask, what's necessary for reading acquisition? So again, the child has to do some kind of signal analysis, learn about letters, how to combine the letters, and do some category learning. But most importantly, they need to have this early exposure and print immersion, which they haven't had. So clearly, babies come equipped with the hardware that's necessary to read. So here's something on babies' eye movements, where they have control of eye movements very early on. You can see the baby following the ball at just three weeks. And their acuity is very good. So by about eight months, they pretty much have the acuity that we have. Uh, so that their vision develops very quickly so that indeed they could read. And their categorization is very good. We said the category learning was an important aspect of learning language. So at one month, they can discriminate a square and a triangle. And at two months, they can discriminate these two objects uh, even though they're both embedded by a circle. So basically, developmental psychology the last couple decades has thrived on showing that babies are these marvelous association engines. Just give them a couple minutes of any kind of uh, input that has statistical constraints and they pick up on it. Uh, they've done this for speech, music, and objects. So for example here, a very early study that was done infants at nine months uh, could categorize these animals depending on the number of legs they had. So they were learning the features of the animals and the number of legs they had. More recent studies show that they can learn the spatial relationship among objects. So they can learn that these two always go together in this fashion and distinguish it from other juxtapositions of the objects. However, no one's ever done it. Here's a temporal study where people, uh, infants at seven months, can pick up this, uh, these constraints among the order of these objects. So uh, one object always, like, always follows another, but the other object only follows it with probability one-third. And infants pick up on this constraint after just a couple, a couple of minutes of exposure. <clears throat> but for whatever reason, um, our developmental psychologists haven't really used letters in these experiments. And what um, one possible experiment would be to do the same kind of experiment to see if they can pick up uh, the contingency among the uh, different letters. And I think letters will act like objects. So Changizi has done a topographical analysis of the various alphabets of the world and has shown that the properties of the uh, 
the symbols in these alphabets uh, tend to have the same properties as objects in the real world, topographical properties, whether it's an architectural world or a pastoral world. Uh, it seems like, according to Schenkezi, which is a pretty interesting idea, that our alphabets developed to mirror the topographical properties of the world so they'd be easy to perceive, not necessarily that they would be easy to write. Okay, so sort of building on the visual system that it would, uh, it, they chose those properties. And that seems to be pretty universal across different alphabets. So we know there's a critical period of development. Uh, we've seen it in speech and sign language and the idea is that it should occur in reading also. So the idea is that it could be that we're actually shielding these kids from written language uh, and that's introducing a, a real challenge that they don't get this written language exposure early on. And you're thinking, well, yeah, but kids do get a lot of exposure, like picture books. So all of us read to our kids, and we think we're giving them a lot of written language. But if you look at picture books, you see that the writing is pretty much overwhelmed by the pictures. And indeed, when you take baby's eye movements, when they're being read to in picture books, they're looking at the pictures and not the words. So they're not learning about print. So we developed a, a little app that we thought might compensate for this fact that they're not getting nice text. And um, let me show you an example of this where what we did is put a number of popular books in our library and do automatic speech recognition and then present the text in a way that's easy to read. Okay. Is that loud enough? Let me play that. Is that loud enough? No. So let's see. Uh, does anybody know where the volume is here? Uh, yeah, well, it should be. Oh. Huh. Okay, maybe it's that video that's uh, not working. Okay. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, um, so basically I was going to, let me see if I can show this on the, uh, on the screen. Well, let me go on to some other demos and we can come back to those so people have time to talk. So, so the idea is that, as you can see, it's a little bit cumbersome because you have to have both the iPad device and the book, and then you're drawing attention of the child to the book. So, so So in this case, what we've done is we've um, also developed an app where we've embedded the content on the iPad as well as the book. But here's one with Read With Me where the mother has to juggle both the book and the iPad. But you can see how the infant attends to the words on the screen. So the words are coming on the screen. You see the infant attending to it one at a time in nice big letters. So here's another one where we've embedded the content in with the, the, the written words. So one thing you might be concerned about is the way we're presenting the visual 
information, that we're presenting one word at a time in big letters in a temporal sequence. This is called the rapid visual serial presentation method that you may have seen in the literature. And in fact, investigators have shown that people can actually read with the same comprehension at a faster rate if they're given this RSVP presentation than if they're given the standard page format. Of course, we've grown up with the page format and we're not gonna be very happy with this. But the idea is that if kids grow up with this presentation method, it'll be a no-brainer. It, and it's more analogous to uh, uh, dynamic language presentation that you're just tracking the information. So this, for me, is a pretty impressive study that uh, people can do so much better uh, with this RSVP presentation than the page mode. So that's our, re our reading application. Another one is to try to represent uh, what the child's experience in uh, with uh, words. So just like you would talk over a child's experience, you want to sort of print over a child's experience. So one thing you might have noticed there that um, you've got to draw the kid's attention to the written language. Uh, so with spoken language, you can talk over the child, but it's been shown that the child really has to be attending to it to learn it. So in sign language, for example, the way the caregivers work with their children, they'll actually sign in front of the object or they'll draw the child's attention and then sign. So the visual modality does require this sort of joint attention where you have to draw the child's attention. Uh, so right now we're working in a preschool where we're trying to show that indeed these infants can learn associations of the written language uh, with nonsense objects. So here we have a little toy and uh, we're going to teach, uh, reinforce Silas with the printed name of the toy. So he, he, sees, he sees the written uh, word, and then we'll be testing to see if he learns this association between the two, like we said with category learning. So this is uh, a figure from my patent application, a method and system for children to uh, acquire literacy. And the idea is that you have a number of input devices. So basically, you're putting the child in an intelligent room with a number of input devices that you want to do scene and action recognition and speech recognition so you know what the child's experiencing. You understand what the child's experiencing, then you access what you know about the child so that then you can present the written language in a form that's appropriate to the child. What you would present to an eight-month-old would be different from what you would present to a two-year-old and then you would have a number of output devices that you could present the information on. So what would, uh, what would some of these output devices work? Well, as you know, robots as companions uh, is becoming an, an idea that's being accepted by more and more people that a child might actually have a robot as a companion that would understand the environment and present the written language uh, to them. A more exciting proposition is a heads-up display. Um, here's a concept video that was done uh, three or four years ago uh, where a farmer goes out and he has these intelligent glasses and he is able to understand the state of his farm and his cows and barn and so on. So he looks out and he gets this augmented reality that tells him uh, that this cow is on antibiotics, its milk shouldn't be mixed uh, with the other milk, the, uh, and so on. And of course, we all would love to have a pair of these glasses because when he goes in for dinner and uh, sees a spouse, the glasses tell him, hey, tomorrow's your anniversary. You better come up with something. So our idea then is that uh, the, we understand what the child's experiencing and we present it in appropriate visual form. So in this case, uh, we've got speech recognition on the glasses. The mother says you did a fine job and we just present the words fine job to the child. So in speech, when kids get a complete sentence, they only 
recognize one or two words. And so the, that would be analogous to that. And of course, you've heard about Google Glass, the idea that you could wear these intelligent glasses and you can take pictures of your kids and so on. So here's a mother with Google Glass and she can take a picture of her baby uh, when she's playing with it and so on. My argument is that the wrong person has on the intelligent glasses. It should be the baby uh, then, then gets the written language that corresponds to their experience with the mother. And eventually, all of this will be on contact lenses um, where the child then could be fitted with a contact lens that would uh, give augmented reality in terms of the written language. So those are the ideas behind early reading and how we can immerse the kids in uh, written language. And it has tremendous benefits. So the idea is that if kids are experiencing written language from day one, we'll have universal literacy. The rate of literacy would be the same as the rate of understanding spoken language. It would reduce the cost of reading instruction. I figured it would only be about 5% of the current cost. And the other thing that it would allow the child to have very, on, very early on in life is the much richer language that you get in print than you get in speech. So we actually did some analyses of the uh, words in picture books versus words of adults talking to one another. And we see that the uh, written language is much more complex than the spoken language in terms of uniqueness of vocabulary, grammatical constructions, things that define complexity of language. So in the written language, the child is being exposed to much more. So if this expo proposal is successful, and um, you know, it probably, I don't know if it'll be tested in my lifetime, but we're trying to, uh, it's going to change how we allocate resources. It's gonna be a great benefit for the deaf and hard of hearing community, and it will even allow us to rethink schooling, which we know is in great trouble. So the first thing has to do with where we put our resources. So right now, if we look at the investment, public investment, as a function of age, uh, we see that it's pretty much linear with age. Um, so that there's much more investment in older kids than younger kids. And this is just the opposite of brain growth, where all the brain uh, growth is happening in the first five years. So we should be investing in preschool kids, uh, not uh, vocation training and so on for adolescents and teenagers. And James Heckman has made the same point uh, where he's looked at, the re as an economist, uh, he's looked at the return on investment and found that the return on investment is much better uh, when you're investing early in life than later on. So uh, this helps us think that you know, we need to invest earlier in kids and the road to reading is one way to do that. Now deaf kids are usually born to hearing parents and so they need uh, to learn written language. And one way to do this would be with this immersion in written language. So the kids could be learning written language at the same time they're learning sign language, uh, for example. So they would then have a written language. Right now, the, the problem in the deaf community is that most uh, high school graduates only read at about a fourth grade level. Uh, kids that are, are using sign language. So if they had written language from day one, uh, they would be much more literate, which is my argument. And then finally, I think we can now uh, envision schooling, perhaps as Don to Dewey thought about, John De Dewey thought about it, that um, rather than having sort of training uh, uh, schools where kids go in and learn uh, reading and writing, uh, if they come equipped with those skills before school begins, then <clears throat> we can think of communities of learning where kids can more easily pursue their uh, interest. So the take home message, and I appreciate listening through this, is that uh, we know for sure, as you know here, technology clearly impacts our life and we should be open uh, to disruptive ideas, uh, even though uh, you know, they might seem a lot different from the way we learned language and learned to read, uh, but we should be open and consider these seriously. 
So I'll be happy to answer questions uh, if people have them. Yeah. Um, how do you? I love this. I love the idea. It's really challenging a lot of concepts we've been working with. But uh, um, having the child learning so early on language, um, do you think the child is also learning other concepts than than language early on, like social interaction and people's interaction? Emotion, I don't know. There's, no. there's a lot of things. So if you bring language earlier, how does it affect all these other skill learning that are also really important? I mean, exactly. language is important, but exactly. other skills are important. So have right. you thought about that? Yes, a lot of people have, and those have been some reactions we had to grant proposals and so on. Uh, so, um, of course, we're exposing the kid to written language early on. They're, they are getting spoken language. and. Uh, the uh, criticisms have been, well, if they're doing this, they're not learning necessary social emotional uh, skills that they need. And I guess that's sort of envisioning the child as sort of a fixed uh, system that it, you know, it can only handle so much, limited capacity. But I think what the developmental literature has shown is this isn't true at all. In fact, the more the child gets, the better they seem to do. One area that this has been really impressive in is bilingual education. So it turns out that kids that grow up bilingual, by, by the time they get to school, they have advantages in vocabulary, learning to read, and uh, other kinds of skills. So, you know, from that argument, you would think that bilingual would put the child as a disadvantage. So one way to think about written language is they're also growing up bilingual in the same language. One is a written form and one is a spoken form. So um, it's certainly an important concern, you know. And Ari and I were just talking about this this morning. You know, how much do you, how much input do you give your kid? How much control, and so on. And uh, are you are you providing the right resources for the child? Uh, my feeling is that there can be a huge synergy between written language and spoken language. So just the opposite, it could make language learning easier in both modalities. Why would that be the case? Well, one thing, as I'm speaking, you think you're hearing silences between the words. They don't exist, all right? So think of the child that doesn't know the words. They, they, there aren't any silences that tells them where the words are, okay? In our orthography, in our written language, we separate the words by spaces. So that's a huge bootstrapping the child would have in terms of discerning where the words are uh, in the written form that they don't get in the spoken form. So uh, this kind of synergy could work that they could, uh, reading could help speech and speech could help reading, that they could actually acquire language more easily. Uh, I'm a big fan of Heckman as well. And I think that uh, his studies concluded when he looked at the preschools that it was the ones that focused on non-cognitive skills, things like motivation, grit, um, emotional mm -hmm. self-regulation mm -hmm. that had the long-term payoffs. Mm -hmm. The ones that focused on cognitive skills mm -hmm. didn't really have that big of a long-term mm -hmm. payoff, if I'm remembering correctly. No, you're so right. Is, I, is literacy a cognitive skill? Or no, no, that's a real good point, isn't it? And I think that has been something disappointing, that these interventions early on with cognitive skills don't seem to last through schooling. Okay, And... Um, I, I would say that it's not a cognitive skill. If, if you remember, what I'm saying is that it can be acquired unencumbered by the thought process. So I think it's really just a very low level skill that the brain can pick up that, that sees the dimensions of the written world that they can then have an advantage and learn this, learn this naturally. So the, uh, I'm not promoting what you see on YouTube that parents are very happy teaching their kids phonics at age two, okay? Uh, so, you know, cat, and they spell out the letters. You know, uh, one of my colleagues told me about his uh, granddaughter that was doing one of these things, you know, and uh, she goes, and there's a picture, and then there's letters, you know. And um, so she got cat, and then the next one showed uh, a, uh, a, a picture, and she went bug, bug, uh, ug, but it actually said insect, 
you know. So, <laughs> so the, uh, that some, some of the downsides of phonics. But one of my mantras, too, is the fact that um, kids learn to read. And how, what do read, reading uh, specialists think? Well, the kid comes equipped with spoken language. So all we have to do is bootstrap the, the written language onto the spoken language. So they learn decoding, all right? They learn phonics. Uh, it's not a bad thing at that age because that they know speech and they're building on it. But the problem is when they get to grade four, the teacher is saying they don't comprehend. All right, uh, so they can uh, read fluently, and this is another downside of our education today, that you know we're leaving no child untested, and the way we're testing for reading is fluency, reading aloud. Okay, the point is you can read aloud as I could read. Uh, Italian and not understand a damn thing, right? I can be very fluent. So, th so one of my ideas is that it's perhaps when these kids get to grade four, they're spending so much effort at decoding that it's, it's interfering with the comprehension process. You had a question? Yeah. Because I think, yeah. Uh, from like what you were saying, I, I don't think there's evidence that you've actually transferred them into people are actually using the symbols. Right. Not right. So the the reason why this you know theory might not get tested in my lifetime is because, again, as I said, that the first year of life the child's had a thousand hours of speech, and so how are we going to get a thousand hours of written language or even a hundred hours of written language in front of the child? And, but I, I do firmly believe that, indeed, um, that if we did, the child would learn to read naturally. They would pick up that structure. And uh, basically, I mean, there's, um, you know, then the, the concept of transfer isn't necessary, right? They're readers. And then they could be reading the literature and so on. In the same way that they're talkers, that doesn't say they're going to be uh, you know, have huge vocabularies and be literary geniuses, but they, they are managing the spoken language. So my argument would be that the, the rate of literacy would be the same as the rate of people that can understand, understand spoken language. It's just a different modality. Right. And, cer and certainly vocabulary does also. Right? So age of acquisition is a very important predictor of vocabulary. So maybe yeah, I wasn't giving myself enough credit so that, um, that uh, if indeed, as we saw, that written language has such a, a more challenging vocabulary and grammar, then bootstrapping the child into written language uh, would be a real advantage because you'd have the age of acquisition ideas. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's, that's really a good point. And there, there are um, uh, s kids, like some autistic kids, learn to read that never, and never learn to talk. So they have dysarthria or something like that. But, um, and what, what, what's that say about that? Well, the autistic kids can really attend to detail. And so there, there may be attending to the detail of the written language that normally developing kids don't. But then there are kids that learn to read naturally without that. So again, I, I, I think that's a good point, one that I should think more about. It would be nice if there were some good data that you had these life histories of these kids to see what, what was responsible for this child to learn to read uh, so easily without instruction. Right. Yeah. I'd be curious to know whether you did some studies uh, for different languages, such as Spanish, which has a very regular orthography, versus Chinese, which might have, you know, <laughs> yeah. certain... Yeah, no, that's a real good point. So to the extent there would be uh, a transparent written language, you would expect it to be easier, right? Because there'd be more of a synergy between the spoken language and the written language. And again, if you took something like Korean, where you have a completely arbitrary relationship between the symbol and the meaning, 
I would say that would be very hard to read, learn to read naturally, in the same way it's hard for their school children that they go year after year to school to learn these 2,000 characters. So to the extent the written language has structure, right, uh, morphology and so on, then it should be easier for the child to discern it. So just like children very early on pick up the structure of their spoken language, they, they, they know what the phonemes are and the segments and so on. So the same would be true with writing. To the extent the written language has structure, the child should learn to read it easier. That's a good point. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.